Hello there, Good Gifts family. This is Nate again, so privileged and so grateful for me to have this opportunity to come and just be with you again. Thanks again to Pastor Derek and all of you who, for this kind invitation. I always find it such an honour and joy to be just part of this fellowship. Today I bring a message entitled, Wholeheartedly. And it is found in the scripture from Joshua chapter 14, verse 6 to 15. So if you have our Bibles and if you don't, then follow on the screen, which you read along with me. Joshua 14, verse 6 to 15. This is what the word of the Lord says. Now the people of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb son of Japuna the Kenizzite said to him, You know what the Lord has said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my fellow Israelites who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt in fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet has walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever, because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Now then, just as the Lord promised, He has kept me alive for 45 years since the time He said this to Moses. While Israel moved about in the wilderness, so here I am today, 85 years old. I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I am just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country and that the Lord has promised me that day. You yourself heard then that as the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified, but the Lord helping me, I will drive them out, just as he said. Then Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Japona, and gave him Hebron as his inheritance. So Hebron has belonged to Caleb, son of Japona, and the Canaanites ever since, because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. Hebron used to be called Kereth Abba, after Abba, who was the greatest man among the Anakites. Then the land had rest from war. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We know that today your word can come alive with your spirit and teach us and meet us at our unique point of need. Father, I pray for every home represented, every person, brother and sister out there connected with us, even online. I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will now be there with us, with each and every one of us. May you teach us, may you convict us, may you meet us at our unique point of need. Lord, we submit ourselves to you and we pray that our hearts and our spirits will be open to your teaching and your guidance and your leadership. Lord, I pray that the words from my mouth and the meditations of my heart, Lord, will truly be acceptable before you. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let us begin today with a declaration. Can I invite you to declare with me? Say after me, without vision, people perish. Let's say that one more time. Without vision, people perish. Now, if you do not remember anything else that I will say to you today, you just need to take away just this one thought, just this one big idea. Without vision, people perish. It just means that without vision, people die. The point of today's message is really this, that you and I need a vision from God. You and I need a vision from God. The wisdom of this truth comes out of Proverbs 29 verse 18. The King James Version says this, Where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Now in the NIV Version, it says this, Where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint. But blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instruction. 
You see, without vision, without revelation, the people cast off restraint. That means that they are aimless, reckless, out of control, and even beyond control. But you know, I think the message version really nails this truth. And this is what it says. If people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what He reveals, they are most blessed. Let me read that one more time. If people can't see what God is doing, can't receive that vision, can't receive that revelation, they will stumble all over themselves, they will perish, they will die. But when they attend to what He reveals, they are most blessed. It cannot be clearer than that. A God-given vision brings life. And when we attend to it, when God reveals, we will be blessed. You see, this is the message of today. As we move from what I call pandemic to endemic, the realization that this COVID thing is not going to go away from us too soon. There's frustration, there's grumblings, and even anger. Many talk about pandemic fatigue. We all know that work from home and home-based learning is not exactly nice. In fact, mental health and mental wellness issues are popping up everywhere. More than just anxiety and fear, actually there's a sense of weariness and a sense of hopelessness. In fact, the New York Times on the 19th of April calls it a feeling of blah. <laughs> A feeling of blah. You know, it's called languishing. Or in English terms, it means a sense of sienness. Okay, sien. Okay, a kind of half dead and half awake kind of stupor. By definition, languishing means this a loss of vigor and vitality, becoming weak or feeble, droopy or fading. Don't we all feel a little bit like that out there right now? Yes, we are all in need of a vision, a God-given revelation. My sense is this, that this is a much-needed word for the coming year. The year 2022 is going to be an important year moving forward. Because you see, in 2021, I believe we went from reset to revisioning. A year of not just breaking through, not just breakthrough, but breaking through at a personal level, at a family level, and even at our communities. You see, where there's a temptation to go about and to give up, you know, to throw in the towel, I believe this is the time where God wants us to push through, wants us to just get going through. You see, the good news is this, is that when we call upon the Lord, He will answer us. We can and you can receive vision. That is the promise from Jeremiah 33, 3. Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. You see, a God-given vision is a vision of faith and faith pleases God. Hebrews eleven six tells us, For without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. So an important question to work through for you and I is this, are we ready to earnestly seek Him? That is a good question that we want to saw, we want to answer today. You know, I remember a few years back when I heard Pastor Peter Sukahiro from Mount Carmel Ministries for the very first time. I remember someone asking him this question. Pastor, how do I know God's will for my life? And without missing a beat, he replied, you will know God's will when you are ready to obey every word that he gives you. Now, it took me a few moments to, to, to appreciate this. That to know and to discover God's will really begins not with the subject or the content, but to discover God's will is really beginning with where the readiness and the willingness to obey. So unless you're willing to obey what He reveals to you, in one sense, why then should God show you His will? 
it is like talking to someone who seeks your advice and you can kind of sense that he's not willing to hear you or listen to your advice. As some would say, no point talking. Recently, I appreciated this a lot more. When I started reading a newly released book by Darlene Cunningham, wife of YWAM founder Lauren Cunningham, entitled Values Matter, Stories of the Beliefs and Values That Shape Youth with a Mission. She wrote that a common question that is often asked of her by mission leaders, pastors and even business leaders is, what is the reason for YWAM's rapid growth? Organizations don't grow at the rate that you all guys have grown or remain true to their founding beliefs decades later. What is your secret? And this was the answer. Very simple, but very deep. We listen to God, we obey Him, and we persevere. Let me say that again. We listen to God, we obey Him, and we persevere. You see, I believe that is the question you and I must answer today. What does it take for us to listen to God, to obey Him, and to persevere, to embrace a vision from God? Well, there's a man in the Bible that exemplifies and embodies this spirit. He listens to God, obeys, and perseveres. He carried a vision in his heart. His name is Caleb, son of Japuna, in the text that we have read right at the start of this service. First mentioned as one of the 12 spies together with Joshua, sent by Moses to explore the land in Numbers chapter 13. Now many of us would know the story by now. You know that the Lord was angered with the faithlessness of the ten and the people who were led astray, in that sense, which led to the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, even as Moses pleaded with the Lord to be merciful. Let's listen to what the Lord said about Caleb, even in this moment of chastisement. Numbers chapter 14, verse 20, uh, chapter, verse 20 to verse 24. The Lord replied, I have forgiven them as you have asked. Nevertheless, as surely as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of thee, those who saw my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, but who disobeyed me and tested me ten times, not one of them will ever see the land I promise on oath to their ancestors. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. Now look at verse 24. This is what then the Lord said about Caleb. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to, and his descendants will inherit it. Let's listen to that again. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to, and his descendants will inherit it. Wow, what a commendation from God himself. What an inspiration and a model for us. You see, it is clear here. Caleb 
had a different spirit. Let's look again at the text in Joshua 14 that we have read. Why then is this Caleb's story here so special? You see, it was a very unique time in the history of God's people. The allocation of the promised land to God's people were all just about done. And Caleb himself was at a very unique season of his life too. From our perspective, Caleb has in one sense done his part in his fair share of duties in one sense, fighting battles on behalf of the other tribes. He was already 85 years old. He has already been in service in one sense for 45 years. And he has all the right reason and even the valid reason to ask for a deferment or an easy assignment. He could have said, leave it to the young people, both by seniority and also by experience. He could have pulled his rank. But what it means here is that Caleb could have just sat back and get comfortable or engage what we, many of us would call cruise control. But we know he did not. He had a different spirit. So let's read again Caleb's visionary and courageous response in Joshua 14 verse 10 to 12 when he says, give me this hill country. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses. While Israel moved about in the wilderness, so here I am today, 85 years old. I'm still as strong today as the day Moses sent out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as he was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out. Just as he said. You see, Caleb had a clear vision. He saw the mountains, he saw the giants too, but he also saw a God that had promised him to give him this mountain. He carried a different spirit. What we can see here in the text is that it accounted, well, no, what we can, can we see here in the text accounted for this different spirit. We see each time this was ascribed to him. The Bible goes on to state very clearly that he followed the Lord wholeheartedly. I want to submit to you that this is the key determinant or contributor to Caleb's different spirit. That confident, lifelong vision he carried in his heart as he followed the Lord wholeheartedly. So the big question that I want us to answer today as we pursue a vision from God, as we follow Caleb's example, what does it take to follow the Lord wholeheartedly? I believe Caleb shows us three fundamental attitudes that will help us carry this different spirit. And they are this, number one, take God at His word. We have an inheritance, ask for it. Number two, trust God for His strength. We have a mission, fight for it. But finally, the third attitude that he carried was, he thanked God for His grace. We have a blessing. Just do it. Let me say that again. Number one, take God at His word. Number two, trust God for His strength. Number three, thank God for His grace. So let's begin with the first. What does it take to follow the Lord wholeheartedly? I believe we must take God at His word because you and I have an inheritance and we can ask for it. Joshua 14, verse 9 and 10 says this, On that day Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever, because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Now then, just as the Lord had promised, He has kept me alive for 45 years since the time He said this to me, while Israel moved about in the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years old. You see, the first thing we learn about Caleb following God wholeheartedly is that he took God at his word, a word given to him 45 years back. He was promised an inheritance and he followed through with it. There was faith, there was belief, there was vision. 
You know, as we reflect on this in our current climate and context, we are in a season of shaking, of things falling apart, and also some picking up, things assuming new shapes and sizes. As they say, COVID has both disrupted and accelerated trends everywhere. And I believe in the church and even in Christian ministries too. Therefore, things are not quite the same as before. We need to check again if the original and core vision is still applicable and relevant. I've spoken much about this and in, uh, in this time, about this need for us in this season to return to our core values and vision and to return to a purpose and a calling before God. As I said, we must remain purpose-driven, destiny-focused and neighbor-directed. In other words, even as things around us get disrupted, we must be anchored in our inheritance. Because you see, our inheritance is a blessing. It's yours to, to claim, to trust God for at His word. You see, why is inheritance significant as we take God at His word? What is inheritance? You can go to the English dictionary and find some definitions of inheritance. Basically, it says it's a hereditary succession to an estate or title. Now, or it is the right of an heir to succeed to property on the death of an ancestor. Or three, something that you may legally be transmitted to an heir. But what it really means is this, the bottom line is this. Inheritance is a right of possession or ownership founded on our identity and relationship. Let me repeat that again. Inheritance is a right of possession or ownership founded in our identity and relationship. And Eric Johnson in his book Momentum says this, Inheritance is never about what you and I have done. It is all about who we are. This story really woke me up. The story of the elder brother in the prodigal son. Many of you know in Luke 15, verse 25, 26, the story of how when the prodigal son came home. And in verse 25, it says, Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked, What was going on? And of course, the elder brother was told that the younger brother has come back and the father has threw a party and a celebration for him. And then in Luke 15, verse 28 and 30, we see the older brother's response. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your, your property with prostitutes come home, you kill the fattened calf for him. Now listen carefully to what the father's sobering and poignant reply in verse 31. Luke 15, 31 says, My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. You are always with me, and everything I have is yours. Now suddenly, aren't we all like that elder brother? Don't we ever realize that everything we have is our inheritance that God has already given to us? And some of us, you and I, live in that inheritance, but yet totally unaware and often ungrateful. God has given us everything, but we continue to live in a mindset of lack or of poverty of heart. There was this funny story told in this book by Eric Johnson, uh, who happens to be uh, Bill Johnson's son. He says that there was a time in his life where God gave him a word that he's going to have 18 months of free coffee. 
as a lesson of what it means to live in God's inheritance. So he said that one day he was just queuing up in a drive-in to get a cup of, 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 of coffee. And when he arrived at that, that, that point where his turn to get a coffee, the attendant said, Oh, sir, uh, not to worry, this coffee is free for you because the car ahead paid for you. Well, that was how it started. Then about two weeks later, he came back to that same drive-in again and as he was driving through, and this time it was a longer queue, and he waited for his time to come and he was about to pay for his cup of coffee. The attendant says, Sorry, sir, you know, there's something happening to our machines today. We want to just compliment you with a cup of coffee. And he said, this went on for 18 months where every occasion, whether he was at a meeting or whether he was walking out the corridor, someone would come up to him and say, Eric, you know, I somehow felt God want me to you know, bless you with this cup of coffee. And it's just like, it went on and on for 18 months. It was like crazy, but God was teaching him a very simple lesson about the fact that there's much, all of life, that God wants to bless us with, and it is already there for you. This is what the scripture says and reminds us about inheritance. Ephesians 1.18 says this, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which He has called you, the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints. This text tells us that God has given us hope in our heart as our inheritance, the riches of His glorious inheritance. Then it goes on to, uh, in Ephesians 1, verse 3 and 6, says this, Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who blessed us in the heavenly realm with every spiritual blessing. It's like every spiritual inheritance in Christ. For He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. In love, He predestined us for adoptions to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with His pleasure and will, to the praise of His glorious grace which He has freely given us in the one He loves. Yes, we are sons and not slaves. And it is in this identity and it is in this relationship that we do have an inheritance. And as Ephesians say, in verse 1 says, in Ephesians 1 says, every spiritual blessing in Christ is available for us. Now there's something interesting about inheritance that we can learn from the text that we have just read in Joshua 14 today. Joshua 14, verse 1 and 2 says this, Now these are the areas the Israelites receive as an inheritance. In the land of Canaan, which Eliezer the priest, Joshua son of Nun, and the heads of the tribal clans of Israel allotted to them. Their inheritance were assigned by lot to the nine and a half tribes, as the Lord had commanded Moses. And when we come to the end of the book of Joshua, Joshua 24, 28 closes this. Then Joshua dismissed the people, each to their own inheritance. I just want to draw your attention to that word, each to their own inheritance. You see, it's because it's important for us to note that yes, inheritance God has given to all of us, but each one of us, in one sense, have our own allocation. So we go back again, and if you go back again to read the chapters in between uh, Joshua 14 and the last of the book, you will notice that the allocations sometimes was very unique. Some by size, some were bigger, some were wider, you know, some had enemies to contend with, uh, some were, were, were clear or had to clear their own ground, uh, some were given by drawing of lords and things like that. And of course, like Caleb, he had to fight and deal with the giants in the land and in the inheritance that he was given. You see, the lesson I want to learn here is this, and I want you and I to learn is this, is that often inheritance is something that we cannot compare with one another. God gives to each one of us right, according to our own. But in Caleb's case, I read something here that reminds me that it's an inheritance that I can ask for. It's an inheritance that I can claim. And on this basis of the relationship and the identity that I have, God says, I have it for you. The Lord will, I pray that the Lord will direct you and, and, and will let the Holy Spirit speak to you as the Lord shows each one of you what is the mountain that He wants to give you. James 1.6 says this, But when you ask, you must believe and no doubt, because the one who doubts it's like a wave on the sea. 
blown and tossed by the wind. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 says, Now to him who is able to go to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. You see, there's something about asking. Why? Because the God that we ask is able to do more than what we dare ask or imagine. You see, there's something about asking for your inheritance. And He is a God that is able and wants to do more for us if we only dare ask and dare imagine. And I believe that when we want to follow God wholeheartedly, we need to take God at His word. We need to receive this as an inheritance from Him and to go forward and trust Him and ask of Him. So what does it take to follow the Lord wholeheartedly? Number one, we must take God at His word. Go. We have an inheritance. Ask for it. Number two, we need to trust God for His strength because we have a mission. We need to fight for it. Joshua 14, 11 says this, Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard that the Anakites were there and the cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me I will drive them out, just as he said. Joshua 14, verse 12. Just as he said. You see, following God wholeheartedly, to me, is a call to discipleship. And there is a cost to discipleship. There will be challenges. There will be conflicts. There will be a clash of values. And yes, there will be, a, there will be spiritual warfare. As we battle not against flesh and blood, in fact, Jesus in Mark chapter 8, verse 34, 35 says this, Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for my sake will save it. You see, therefore, following God wholeheartedly is often about doing hard things for God. As in Matthew chapter 7, verse 14, it says this, But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Why is this such a test of following God wholeheartedly? I want to suggest to you it's because we know that it is about, because it is all has to be about God and God alone. And there should be no shred of credit or glory to ourselves. Frank Damasio wrote in his book, Miracles, says this, We must put a demand on our faith and a demand for the anointing. We must contend for miracles. I really like that. It's doing the hard things, contending for miracles. Following God wholeheartedly will push us to the edge between the kingdoms of this world and the kingdom of God. In this contestation and putting a demand on our faith, I recall a book written many years back by two teenagers. And the, the title of the book was Do Hard Things, A Teenager's Rebellion Against Low Expectation. It's by the authors Alex and Brett Harris. It was a bestseller then, and as the book shatters our cultural ideas of what adolescents really mean, being lazy, soft, and uninterested. And it challenges teenagers, because they were teenagers themselves, to do five kinds of hard things. And Alex and Brett Harris calls it a revolution. Okay? What are these five things? It says, number one, things that are outside your comfort zone. Number two, things that go beyond what is expected or required. Number three, things that are too big to accomplish alone. Number four, things that don't earn an immediate payoff. And number five, things that challenge the cultural norm. Yes, we need to do the hard things. But as I thought through this message and, and, and all the texts that we've just read and in the context of what we are learning from Caleb's life, I see this call not just as something that teenagers 
have to be awakened to, but also a very pressing call to our current, older and more senior generation. Especially in Singapore, where things are generally not too bad, even with the pandemic. Coupled with that sense of blah and the sienness, it is tempting to let our guard and our passions drop. I'm very aware that this is a message that my generation and I need to hear urgently. We probably need to restart a rebellion against low expectation. Even as we come to this senior age, Maybe we could retitle this book, Do Hard Things, A Senior's Rebellion Against Low Expectation. Here I'm sure you know, Pastor Derek Hong is one of my heroes in this. Even at his age, he continues to persevere, press on, and do hard things for God. You know, this reminds me of one of those natural age-related muscle loss condition called sarcopenia. Research has shown that after the age of 30, you and I will begin to lose as much as 3 or 5% per decade of our muscle mass. Most men will lose about 30% of their muscle mass during their lifetime. So the question many of us would ask would be, how do we stop this muscle loss as you age? Is it even possible? And the answers from the doctors, researchers and the therapists says, yes. The primary treatment for sarcopenia is exercise. Specifically, resistance training and strength training. These activities increase muscle strength and endurance using weights or resistance bands. And if I may add, carrying grandchildren too. <laughs> now if this happens in the natural to our bodies, what about in the spirit? Is there spiritual sarcopenia? Recently, I heard another pastor preach about spiritual uh, 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 glaucoma, you know, uh, uh, no, spiritual cataract, you know. So how can we prevent it? I believe spiritual resistance training will help us. Do the hard things in faith. Put a demand on your faith. I believe that a key reason for Caleb at 85 years old following God wholeheartedly, was able to say, give me this mountain. And he was able to trust God for God's strength and willing to fight was because he had this belief that it is something that he continues to know that God's strength will help him to overcome. Not trusting his own physical, spiritual body, but indeed God will be his strength for it all. I know many of us, were very moved and excited about this year's uh, National Day song, The Road Ahead. And I, for one, was touched by the reminder and challenges that indeed, if we had done it before, we can surely do it again. Now, definitely a great encouragement for us in a time and season such as this. However, I did have a small check in my spirit as I could not quite fully agree wholeheartedly. Because you see, if this new season or day that COVID is pushing us into, and as many of us had what we call a new normal, the question I have in my mind is that, is normal what we should be stretching for? Or is God really wanting us to break through even to something really better and greater. Are we missing here an opportunity to go beyond normal and to thrive and to fly? Yes, we may have done it before, but maybe, but maybe we should not just do it again, but we should do it better. Because you see, COVID has shown us or exposed our failings, our fault lines, our gaps in our society too. Can we say to our foreign guest workers, we did it before, we do it again? No, things have to change. We must do better. And I believe we can do better and we need to just go beyond normal. One of the most simple but powerful verses that I've grown up with and even to this day 
is a constant source of encouragement to me to be wholehearted with the Lord. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, with all your heart wholeheartedly, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to Him, and He will make your path straight. What would we need to follow God wholeheartedly? I believe we need to trust God at His word because we have an inheritance, ask for it. Secondly, we need to trust God for His strength. We have a mission, we can fight for it. But finally, how does you and I take, follow the Lord wholeheartedly? We must thank God for His grace. We have a blessing. Let's just do it. You know, often when we follow the Lord wholeheartedly, the journey may seem long and the ending is not quite clear. A key value and attitude required on this journey would be faithfulness and perseverance. Let me recap again. What were the three things that, why, that helped YWAM continue on this progressive journey that God has blessed them with in the kingdom of God. What did Darlene Cunningham say? We listen to God, we obey God, and we persevere. And we see this same thing in Caleb. Joshua 14, 17, 7 says, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Benir to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions. Then Joshua 14 verse 10 and 11 goes on to say, Now then, just as the Lord promised, He has kept me alive for 45 years. Since the time He said this to Moses, while Israel moved about in the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years old. I'm still strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. You see, after six years, after seven years, after 40 years, when nothing happens, what would you say? What would you say? Would you say, I give up? Would you be discouraged? Or would you stay and carry on, even as pandemic becomes endemic? It is in these moments where you will have to take stock and recognize where you could have been and where things could have gone to. You begin to see and experience what I call much undeserved blessings and favour. Totally unmerited. You and I will begin to experience grace upon grace. And you thank God for His grace. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says this, But He said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why the most appropriate response to grace is to move in faith. And just do it. Seemingly unreasonable, not quite logical, and yes, often out of the box. That's why Joshua 14, 12 is so amazing. When Caleb turned to Joshua and says, Give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out, as he said. He just did it. I began this message today with a story of a man named Caleb. In closing, I'd like to end this story with another man named Caleb. He is my dear brother and friend, Pastor Caleb Chan from FCBC. He and his wife, Christina, missionaries to Japan, now living in Sendai, the Hoku region, northeast Japan. You see now in the slides a picture of Pastor Caleb at FCBC's first service in Sendai. 1st November 2014. You see, Pastor Caleb left his job as a banker and answered God's call to full-time ministry and became 
the missions pastor of FCBC in 1993. And the Japan story really began in 1998. Pastor Caleb was visiting some missionaries in Kazakhstan, in Central Asia, where a German prophet there prayed over him and saw a vision. And in this vision, he saw Pastor Caleb carrying the flag of Japan on his left hand, and on his right hand was the Olympic torch. The message given to him on that day was that, Caleb, you're going to bring revival to Japan. You're going to be part of the efforts to bring revival to Japan. From that moment on, the fire was lit in his heart for Japan, and he knew that one day this vision will be fulfilled. In the meantime, <laughs> there was still much work to be done back here in Singapore. And even though many times he felt that he was ready to go, FCBC was not ready to release him. But Caleb did not lose heart. He submitted to the leadership, trusted God for the right time, and continued to hold that vision in his heart. Then, on March 11, 2011, just after, hours after the, a magnitude 9.0 earthquake and tsunami struck the northeast coast of Japan, Caleb staring at the images of the deadly waves and rivers shat and the rivers of shattered homes on screen, Caleb knew that the time has come. As building collapsed, fire engulfed the cities and the nuclear plant exploded. Thousands died across 20 prefectures and thousands more were rendered homeless. Caleb got himself ready to get onto the ground. Over the next five days, he hurried to pack his bags and make contact with the pastors he knew in the midst of the havoc. By 16th of March, which was just five days later, he was on the ground in Sendai, helping to hand out supplies through the local church. He stayed on there for another three and a half months, partnering the humanitarian organization Samaritan's Purse to coordinate relief efforts with FCBC Singapore which sent some 200 volunteers over in just those few months of the disaster. After the relief efforts, finally in 2013, Caleb got his go-ahead. FCBC sent Pastor Caleb, his wife, and two other church workers to start a church plant in Japan. His first stop was Kensunuma, a fishing port two hours by train from Sendai. He went there to assist a pastor from Katsunuma First Bible Baptist Church, whose building was wrecked by the tsunami. It has been five years since Pastor Caleb moved then the church from Katsunuma to Sendai, and also planted two other churches in Yokohama and Nagoya. So his first service in Sendai was 1st November 2014. And this is what Caleb had to do. And every time I talk to him, he tells me, on Saturday afternoon, he'll preach at Sendai. On Sunday, he'll take a train to Yokohama, preach at the Yokohama church, and then either stay over or then train to Nagoya and, and meet with the Nagoya congregation on Monday night. And then on Tuesday, catch up with many of the members there and then make his way back to Sendai again. And this was his regular weekly schedule. But you know, what about the Olympic torch and the Japan flag? in that vision in 1998. In fact, in August 2013, when Caleb and his wife moved to Japan, some 16 years after that vision, exactly a month later, the country announced it was hosting the 2020 Olympics. Everyone was excited and much so more so Caleb and Christina. But then the situation drastically changed, right, with the pandemic. And the pandemic hit the world and plagued with fear, anxiety, confusion and troubles. But you see, the church continued to arise, especially in that time. I believe it is because of the pandemic that the church began to come together. And many intercessors from many nations gathered through Zoom to pray every day for Japan uh, for the duration of the Olympics and the Paralympics. 
praying for a change in the spiritual climate and the hearts of the people to turn Godward. Well, you know what Caleb reported to us? That within a week of their praying, two women from his church in Sendai were baptized, one in the sea and the other in the river nearby. Praise the Lord. And this is what Caleb wrote to me just a few days ago. The Olympics have come and gone. So what about the promised revival for Japan? For nations around the world, 2020 and 2021 has been two very difficult years, politically, economically, and spiritually. I see 2020, 2021, 2022 as a period of transition into something new that God is leading Japan to. Revival is not just a walk over to possess the land. It is fighting for the territory that God wants to give us. So 2020 started with intense spiritual warfare. We were drawn into battle for our faith and the faith of others. Satan knows his end is drawing near. So he is doing everything he can to discourage us with problems in our nation, our church, our homes and our own personal lives. On the other hand, how else will people turn to Jesus if everything is fine? We have to expect more sickness, economic problems and even social problems. So we have to lay our lives down for the greatest harvest that is to come. When I got that note from him, I can't help but read this promise back to my brother Caleb. Numbers 14, verse 24. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to and his descendants will inherit it. Amen. Amen, isn't it? So what does it take to follow the Lord wholeheartedly? Remember, you and I, number one, we need to take God at His word. We have an inheritance. Ask for it. Number two, we need to trust God for His strength. We have a mission. We need to fight for it. But finally, we need to thank God for His grace because we have a blessing. Just do it. Today, as I bring this message to a close, I sense deep in my heart that the Lord wants to minister to many of us out there today who have been disappointed and discouraged. In fact, I sense that many of us here in this call and in this connection in this church Many of us have had visions that God has given to us. Goals and passions that you know came from the Lord. You heard from the Lord. You obeyed Him. But now I sense the Lord say to you, you need to persevere. You need to not give up. Because you see, in between the lines of the message that I've just shared with you, is that God wants to remind us again that there is an allotted inheritance that you and I have. So don't regret it. Don't give up. The Lord wants to tell us that unless we ask for it, it is always about faith. We need to press in. But finally, we also know, need to know that even in the midst of war, we can find rest. And we can rest in Him. That's why I believe today, the Lord wants to minister and encourage you today with a vision from Him. Indeed, today, we can claim this promise. Without a vision, the people will perish. And I believe that if you and I can see what God is doing, then we won't stumble all over ourselves. Because when we attend to what He reveals, you and I will be most blessed. So in a moment, I'm going to ask to be quiet for a while. 
And as we are quiet, I want the Lord and the Holy Spirit to speak to each and every one of us, first at a very personal level. And I believe for some, the Lord is going to speak to you even about your family. And He will deposit in you a vision. Or He will refresh that vision that was already there, that kind of like was languishing in this season. And God wants to fire it up again for you. God wants to remind you that it is an inheritance. It is a mission. And it is a blessing. And I'm going to close praying boldness and courage. I'm going to pray boldness, courage and faith upon each and every one of us. I'm going to pray the spirit of Caleb that will be different and that you and I would serve and walk with him wholeheartedly. And as we do that, yes, the Lord may push us to the edge. The Lord may push us to a place where we will be uncomfortable, where we, you and I may have to do the hard thing. But we know that we can depend and trust God for His strength. So would you pray? As the music plays in the background, I'd like us to just take this moment of quiet. Whether you're listening to this in your own living room, or in your own private room, or even in a earpiece that you're listening to, I want the Holy Spirit to come and speak to us. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are here. We thank you that, Lord, your love, your grace will be our sufficiency. Often, yes, Lord, we find ourselves weak. We find ourselves even languishing. But Lord, I pray today, and I know today, the Holy Spirit wants to give us life. So Lord, I pray first for healing of the disappointments and the discouragement. I pray that, Lord, you will ignite in many of us here today a refreshed vision. You will open our eyes to see not just the mountains, to see not just the giants, but to see a God that has His eternal plans and purpose laid out for His people. And that you and I can be a part of that glorious inheritance. Father, I pray for boldness and courage to us. I pray for boldness and courage to receive. And I pray today, Lord, for boldness and courage to follow you wholeheartedly. Lord, we know that we don't have the strength. We know that we have to be in such a position to contend for miracles and to make a demand of our faith. Because you are a God that can be trusted, you're a God that can lead us through, and you're a God that wants to give us life. So Father, we bless you. Bless my brothers and sisters in this congregation and in this church today. Release us for your greater glory and your greater purposes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.